It's my great pleasure as Master of Birkbeck to welcome you to our first Rosalind Franklin lecture. We do have, of course, um, in the college a number of um, lectures commemorating individuals who played a significant role um, in Birkbeck. J.D. Bernal, for example, one that is close to um, this particular area, but others commemorating, um, indeed, former masters. Um, Eric Hobsbawm, the former president of the college, who was associated for 60 years um, with the college. All those, of course, are designed to commemorate in particular the contribution of distinguished individuals to the college. So we're delighted um, that we now have a Rosalind Franklin lecture. We're very pleased that Jennifer Glynn, her sister, has agreed to our naming this lecture and we're particularly pleased that Jennifer, together with her husband, Professor Ian Glynn, um, are here. It seems um, a lifetime ago that I went to Ian's crystal clear lectures um, in Cambridge on physiology, but I do still remember them. So particular welcome um, to both of you and, of course, we're delighted um, to welcome and have the Rosalind Franklin lecture. Rosalind did come here for her last post um, before she unfortunately passed away um, and um, I think she perhaps hopefully had a better experience here than she had during her epoch-making research um, at King's. I was shown a quote where she said moving from King's to Birkbeck was like moving from a palace to a slum, um, but rather more pleasant. So at least we did get the, um, the pleasant. Um, Unlike most of the other memorial lectures that we do have, this is not only about uh, memorializing, but it's also about the celebrating and promoting the contribution of women um, in science. And that's why um, this lecture will, in this year and future years, be given by a distinguished woman scientist in an area um, that Birkbeck is active in scientifically and intended to be part of the college's Athena Swan program of promoting um, the contribution of women in science and indeed across um, all areas of the college. So we are delighted um, that the first Rosalind Franklin lecture will be in the field of X-ray crystallography that Rosalind Franklin herself was in, will be delivered by the very distinguished um, X-ray crystallographer, professor of molecular biophysics in Oxford, um, Professor Sir Elspeth Garman, um, and of course I've been briefed on Elspeth's very many contributions um, on her role in what's called the Garman limit of tolerance of crystals to X-ray crystallography. Um, her role not only as a distinguished researcher but as a distinguished teacher carrying out courses around the world um, in X-ray crystallography training new people as well. All that is incredibly impressive. All that is what we would expect in a distinguished um, named lecturer at Birkbeck. But the unique feature tonight is that nobody in all my years in Birkbeck, in all these memorial lectures, has ever been able to link their scientific subject to the production of chocolate. Um, and so, for that reason, if for no other, it's a great delight to invite Professor Elspeth Garman to deliver the first Rosalind Franklin Memorial Lecture. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to give this lecture. I feel really honoured. Uh, and uh, I started life as a nuclear physicist, and in the last five years I've given a Dorothy Hodgkin Memorial Lecture, a Bragg Memorial Lecture, uh, the Braggs, uh, a Kathleen Lonsdale Memorial Lecture, and now I feel that my, my set is absolutely um, perfect um, being invited to give the Rosalind Franklin uh, inaugural uh, lecture. So it's a, it's a great honour um, for me to be here. Um, before I start, um, I'm going to show you a two-minute, 53-second video of what crystallography is that um, I made uh, with the help of one of my graduate students and a very good animator and storyteller for the International Year of Crystallography, the year before last. Um, so uh, bear with it, but it will summarise everything I'm going to say. So if it's all that you <coughs> get out of the lecture, you'll at least know what we do. Um, so I hope you en enjoy it. It was great fun to make it, and I have a completely new respect for filmmakers ha having done this. Sometimes edible. Sometimes precious. Often beautiful and inspiring. Crystals, as the basis of the scientific technique crystallography, can also be very useful if you want to find out the structure and shape of things. Easy, you might think, but what if the objects are too small to be seen or touched? What if you want to find out the shape of a protein or a virus? I need a volunteer. 
Splendid. Step up, please, my little green friend. We're going to find out what shape you are. First, we're going to shrink you down to the size of an average protein. Then multiply you. Then add you to a solution. Next, we grow a crystal, a dark heart. Scientists use robots to control the variables, and even then it can take years for a usable crystal to form. Luckily, <laughs> I have a secret crystal-growing spell. Oh, once the crystal's formed, we barrage it with x-rays. Normally, this involves a trip to a synchrotron. Tonight, however, I am going to use an x-ray gun of my own invention. <laughs> So we place the crystal on a goniometer so that we can rotate it whilst it's bombarded. The X-rays are diffracted by the crystal and due to the uniform structure, interference patterns occur forming clear spots known as reflections. Unfortunately, the crystal is often damaged by the bombardment. But if the spots on the screen are clear enough, then using the mathematical method of Fourier transformation, I'm sure you've heard of it, the 2D images taken at different rotations can be converted into a 3D model showing the density of electrons. X-ray crystallography has allowed scientists to map the shape of many useful and important structures. Penicillin, DNA, insulin. Of all the shapes uncovered though, surely none is more amazing than Oh, a round of applause for our little green volunteer. Now, who wants to be sawn in half? <laughs> Goodness, you are a keen one. Can single crystals really be several metres long? How do you work out a shape from a pattern of spots? Why is the structure and shape of things important anyway? For the latest research to answer all these questions and more, visit www.oxfordsparks.net slash crystal. Okay, so that's it really. Uh, that's the lecture in a, in, in a nutshell. Um, so uh, I'm going to take you through that a little bit more slowly uh, and um, point out uh, where Rosalind Franklin's uh, great contribution was made um, when, when, when I come, come to it. So um, Rosalind Franklin was uh, a chemist and an X-ray crystallographer, as I'm sure you all know who attended St. Paul's Girls' School, um, and I was able to go there a uh, year before last and give a talk um, in, the, in, in the school where she was actually, actually attended uh, about crystallography. Um, so they, they were very pleased about that. They're very proud of her. She went to Newnham College, Cambridge, and did the natural science tripos. And then she got a PhD from Cambridge on, but actually working mainly um, for the British, um, or, or a, a research part of the British Coal Board um, in, in Kingston. But her uh, PhD was actually written up for the University of Cambridge on the properties of coal, uh, which is a crystalline substance uh, in which he did a lot of very important systematic work in order to optimise the combustion temperatures and the use of various sorts of coals um, from around Europe which she absolutely loved from 47 to 51 and again worked on coals and graphites before coming back to King's College on a fellowship from 51 to 53 where she studied DNA fibres, um, in particular DNA form B. Um, uh, well actually it, A, but her f very famous picture is of form B which I'll come to uh, later. Then we're in Birkbeck, so the, the red, the important bit, um, <laughs> is the Birkbeck College from uh, 53 to 58. And as uh, the master already mentioned, uh, he, he took that quote from me. I, I, it's a wonderful quote. Um, and it doesn't look like a slum to me. Um, so, so it's obviously improved um, since uh, sh she moved. Uh, but she was much happier here than um, at King's College. Um, so. Here, she studied viruses, um, RNA, and she was a senior scientist with her own research group. Um, and Bernal was the um, head of the, uh, of the unit, and he was very encouraging. Uh, he recruited enormously talented scientists and then let them loose, basically, and didn't interfere, didn't ask them too much about what they were doing. 
and uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, appreciated that very much. So here she is looking um, at a DNA fibre, um, probably, uh, having posed for a number of such photographs. You're never quite sure what people are really looking at when they're photographed at a microscope. But, um, uh, and uh, he's an absolutely beautiful uh, photograph of her here, and the famous photograph 51, which I'll come back to. So what is crystallography, and why are crystals beautiful and fascinating? So many of you are familiar with diamonds and sapphires, which are um, inorganic crystals, very, very hard. If you stick your fingernail into your diamond of your ring, you wouldn't expect to leave a mark. And if you do, then you've been sold a dud, I can tell you. And your diamond should be uh, very hard. Um, here's a, um, a crystal. So what is it that makes something a crystal? Well, it's the fact that it's in an ordered, repeatable array that makes it a crystal and defines it a crystal. So why is there a bar of chocolate in the middle of this um, array of crystals? Well, um, crystals come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. These are the biggest ones ever found in the world. They're 37 feet long, made of selenite, so calcium sulfate with some water, and they're in a cave called the Cave of Crystals, surprise, surprise, um, in Mexico. Um, they're at 50 centigrade, and they've been growing for about half a million years. And one of the scariest things in my life was being on the forum with, uh, on the World Service BBC with a lady who'd been into this cave uh, and discussing with Bridget Kendall the fact that she had isolated 54 different microbes from inclusions in these crystals and brought them back to her lab in New Mexico and grown them up in Petri dishes. And it's like, well, they've been in this cave quite safe from human beings for half a you know, million years. Are they going to cause any biohazard? And she dismissed me um, uh, live on the radio. Oh, no, no, they're fine, you know, but I do wonder. So you don't get an idea about how big these are until you notice that this is a man standing here. Can you see him here? So these crystals are absolutely enormous. There is some worry that they will start dissolving because of going in and out and changing the ambient conditions, which are very hot and steamy indeed. 50 centigrade, you have to wear an ice suit. So these are the biggest crystals, but the sort of crystals I'm going to talk to you about today are much, much smaller. So this is a hundredth of an inch, this crystal, and it's a crystal of insulin, um, as um, in a human insulin. We also find crystals in uh, industry a lot. This is a turbine blade that's been made in a high-pressure argon injection of titanium alloy, and it's actually one single crystal that's been extruded, which makes it extremely strong. So we, we, we're surrounded in crystals, but the, um, the, the first ever crystal structure to be solved was by the Braggs, uh, father and son pair of salt. So table salt, rock salt, I brought some along just to... Um, as, a, as, as a, it's a, a real bring you down to earth from the, from the science. And they discovered that the sodium and the chlorine in uh, salt, and salt was actually arranged in this um, lattice like this, this regular array, and that actually one sodium didn't belong to one chlorine. Chemists had always thought they were a pair and they went around one sodium, one chlorine, um, bound very tightly to each other, instead of being actually regularly spaced like this and they share their electrostatic charge between them, uh, making this, this array here. You can see this is a British stamp, it doesn't need the label because it's got our queen on. So um, uh, Von Laue actually was the first to notice scattering from copper sulfate that you got uh, x-rays scattered in a particular patterns, but he wasn't able to um, interpret it. And it was the younger Bragg who um, actually worked out Bragg's law um, rather than the older Bragg. So here's sodium chloride, chlorine uh, negatively charged. It's, it's um, stolen the electron from sodium in order to bind it electrostatically. And the sort of size that this um, little crystal is, is a fifth of a, 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 sorry, a half of a nanometer, which is a half of a millionth of a millimeter. So the sort of sizes I'm talking about today are absolutely minute, tiny, and you can't really imagine how small these are. This is a pavement in Adelaide where older Bragg was professor of physics and younger Bragg was born, and they like to claim the Braggs as Australian Adelaideans, which is fair enough. I would want to if they were born there too. So here they are, and my advice is never ever call your children the same name as you because it causes um, a lot of confusion, especially when you both win the Nobel Prize together. <laughs> um, so we've got William Henry Bragg here, or um, uh, Henry, William Henry, and we've got William Lawrence. Um, and they actually won uh, the Nobel Prize when um, 
William Lawrence, the younger one, was in France um, in World War I, and he heard that he'd won a Nobel Prize, and he was only 25. His father was professor at 23. So they were an uh, incredible, incredible pair. So their law, which I'll come back to too, uh, their work paved the ways for us to find the three-dimensional shape of very, very many things, um, from proteins to chocolate to minerals and to DNA. So what about chocolate? That's really why you've all come, I know. Um, so chocolate comes in um, uh, six different crystal forms. And the art of the chocolatier is to get the chocolate that you like to eat, not the one that sort of bends when you bite into it um, or goes white when you leave it in the air. Um, and the one that we all like is number five here, glossy firm, best snap, melts near body temperature. Uh, and if you, if you have one of these other crystal forms of, of chocolate, it's not much fun. It melts in your pocket. It doesn't snap nicely. And the trouble is that temperature will actually change the form of these, these different crystal forms of chocolate. That's the actual molecule of chocolate, the active ingredient. And chemists do something very unfriendly, which is at where these lines meet, there's a carbon atom, but they don't bother to write that there's a carbon atom there. So at every place here, there's a carbon as well. And then there's oxygen, uh, carbon up here, a hydrogen, nitrogen um, forming here. So that's the actual molecule. So how does the chocolatier get the sort of chocolate that you like? Well, they have to actually temper it. And uh, we, if you start at room temperature and you heat the chocolate up to about 115 Fahrenheit, note the non-SI units here, um, you melt all the crystals and then you cool it and try and get the ones you want, which you remember were number five. If you look at an untempered um, chocolate, it's sort of cloudy. Do you see that? And also if you keep your chocolate too long, it goes like that in the cupboard. I can't imagine you do, but they do go white. Um, or shiny is the sort that we want. Now, can anyone tell me what's wrong with this graph? Why would any undergraduate be sent to the bottom of the class for producing a graph like that? No axes. Yay, great. You can come to my math classes. OK, so we need, um, we need axes here. Um, the temperature up here and the, and the, um, the, the depiction of the um, tempering process. So if we allow it to cool to around 80, and then we reheat it because we want to get rid of the number fours, which actually have a lower melting point than the one we want, which is the five. So we basically don't want to destroy these guys. We want to destroy everything less. And we don't want to make it so uh, hot that it takes weeks to form and it's very, very hard. So this is all crystallography, chocolatier. Um, now, uh, you may not like those units, so here's the one in centigrade. Uh, but I couldn't find it in English. It's in Spanish. <laughs> so if you want to know how to temper your chocolate, those are the centigrade uh, temperatures that you ought to have. So what about um, proteins? And what are proteins? Well, proteins are the active molecules in your body um, that allow you to digest your food, move your arm when you um, uh, um, uh, transfer energy, stored energy, um, to your muscles to move. They're, they're the active, in, um, uh, replaceable parts in your body that you need all the time. What are they made of? Well, here, red is oxygen, green, uh, blue is nitrogen, and then the, the grey, boring ones are carbon, as usual. Um, and if you look, they're all the same up the top here, these 20 amino acids of which the proteins in your body are constituted. And what they do is they form long chains of beads, like this chain here. And there's 20 different colors of beads. And they never form Y shapes. They always form long strings like this, single strings, because it's impossible to invent a little molecular machine that can actually produce something with a Y shape. It would have to go down one arm and then come back up again and then go down. And that's very inefficient. So they always come like this in strings. And these amino acids, um, they, um, they're all exactly the same, apart from this bit here. You can see these are different. Two of them have got sulfur in, which are important for us as crystallographers. Um, but they form these long chains by uh, water coming out. And they can be very, very long, hundreds and hundreds of amino acids long. Now, what the chemists can do is they can so-called sequence this protein. And they can say, oh, OK, at position 400 here, you've got a small yellow elephant. Right? Or you've got glycine. You've got one of the 20 amino acids. But what we cannot do by computer 
um, simulation yet or calculation is work out how this protein wraps up like wet spaghetti in three dimensions and actually goes around in your bloodstream and what it's interacting with what in your stomach and so on. We need to know, as structural biologists, what's on the outside and what's on the inside of this molecule so we can see what it interacts with, understand mechanisms and understand uh, when it goes wrong. So, uh, what we do is we use the system, we use the method of crystallography to find this. So this pr particular protein is called tumor necrosis factor. You can see it's got 20 different colors, different amino acid labels here going around. It um, starts here at the so-called N-terminus and goes around here. But this doesn't tell us what's on the outside, what's on the inside, and how tumor necrosis factor manages to kill, um, kill tumors. Uh, in cancer remission. Okay, we don't get that information from that two-dimensional string of beads. So how does it actually fold up like wet spaghetti? Well, if we look at all the atoms in it, we can see that here's a trimer, so three of them go around together. This gives us absolutely no information about the connectivity within it. It's not very helpful. It's just a blob of atoms. So what we tend to do, without telling anyone actually, is we tend to strip out the beads and just show the string. So although it would really look like this and be a oops, absolutely full of um, atoms, um, uh, we, we, we strip it out and we just tend to show the, uh, the string through the beads so that we can follow where that string goes and how it goes. So this one you may have had in your milk this morning. Um, there's a calcium atom in the middle, which is uh, your gut will uh, open this out, has an enzyme in it that opens this out and lets the calcium out. So this is the protein that you had in your milk, but it's been magnified many, many millions of times, um, obviously, here. So in, if we could actually look to see what it would look like, as I say, it would look more like this. This is lysozyme, which is a protein that you have in your tears. So when you blink um, to stop bacteria actually invading your eyes and getting in, you have this antibacterial agent which is lysozyme um, and this is what it, it looks like. This is a very ancient papier-mâché model of it and this is at higher detail than this one which is not at, this is the sausage uh, representation and this is how pr uh, protein crystallographers used to have to go to um, their lectures and take things like this to show their structures. Now of course we can show it on the computer. So, the, uh, sorry, I meant to show you this. This is two amino acids joined together to form these long, long stringy bits. And there's a line that goes through, which is the string through the, through the, uh, uh, through the, through the beads. OK, so uh, what three-dimensional structures um, uh, do we know, and how big can we manage to solve them? So the, the, we've got penicillin here, solved by Dorothy Hodgkin. Um, in 1949, and that's got 27 atoms that are not hydrogen. Remember, there's carbon ones linking at these corners here. Um, she also solved the uh, structure of vitamin B12 in 1954, and that's got 80 non-hydrogen atoms. And Bernal famously said to her, oh, you'll get a Nobel Prize for these two structures, for this uh, fantastic work. Um, and she said, oh, I'd much rather be made a fellow of the Royal Society. And he said, oh, that'll be much harder. <laughs> And unfortunately, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, um, anyway, um, insulin, which Dorothy Hodgkin also solved, and is hugely important, understanding what's on the outside and the inside of insulin so that analogues can be made that get absorbed more slowly by a diabetic so they don't have to inject so often, which is a sort of direct, understandable application of our work. That had um, 829 non-hydrogen atoms. So that's 1969. Where are we now? Well, he, uh, here is um, Dorothy Hodgkin in her lab under the museum in Oxford. And it's very like the X-ray equipment that actually Rosalind Franklin used in King's and here in Birkbeck, uh, which no, no shielding at all, so lots of X-rays flying around the room, no worries about safety. Um, and uh, so you had to, this lab actually was even more unsafe because you entered it through a ladder in the, in the in the floor. So you actually had, it was in the basement and, and the ladder got there. So where are we now? Well, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded in 2009 um, to Venki Ramakrishnan, who's now president of the Royal Society, Tom Stites and Ada Yonath in Israel, um, for the ribosome. This is the machine that actually manufactures the proteins that I was talking about, the one that makes the strings, and that has 293,658 non-hydrogen atoms. So we've gone up from 829 in 1969 
now to uh, nearly 300,000 non-hydrogen atoms. This is absolutely tour de force, and it's the central dogma of molecular biology that the DNA worked on by Rosalind Franklin, which has your um, genetic information, uh, transcripts to RNA, which then translates um, in the ribosome to protein. And this is an unviolatable path, except if you are a retrovirus, and then you can go backwards. So why do we want to know the three-dimensional structures of these things? I think I've already, I hope I've already convinced you why insulin is important. We can design analogs that are absorbed more slowly. Um, penicillin, we can design uh, newer generations of penicillin, of, uh, sorry, of antibiotics, because resistance to antibiotics is a huge problem, which you've probably all read about as well. Um, and uh, we can do drug discovery. So this is a flu virus, which has uh, got eight strands of negatively uh, stranded RNA in the middle of it. And it's got two proteins on the outside. One's the H and one's the N, hemagglutinin and uraminidase. And the hemagglutinin um, acts as Velcro. So when the person next door to you breathes a flu virus near you, just get a bit further away from them. But it, uh, this Velcro, the, the, the yellow stuff, the hemagglutinin, uh, latches onto one of the uh, acids on the outside of your cell called sialic acid, and then it gets into the cell, reproduces, um, and makes many more flu viruses, uh, progeny ones that burst out of that cell, killing it. But there's a major design fault because if it did that, then these yellow ones on the new progeny viruses would stick to the dead cell and be unable to move further and infect. So it's got a pair of scissors, which is this neuraminidase, the N in H5N1 or H1N1. Um, and there's, uh, it goes around in a tetramer. There's four of these. And I've got one here. And what it does is chop the sialic acid off. So here is a big flu virus. And here are the little uh, uh, sialic acids being chopped off so that the new viruses can go and infect more um, cells here. So um, why might we, it help us to know the structure of... Um, of this? Well, if we could design something that bound even more tightly in the little pocket in the neuraminidase, then we could block that by sniffing that drug so that when the progeny viruses burst out of the cell, the, the, all these little um, pockets are already full and it can't act as scissors, so therefore you don't get flu so badly. And that's how Relenza and Tamiflu work. So, Rosalind Franklin worked on um, viruses. In fact, the first virus ever to be discovered was um, tobacco mosaic virus. Um, and um, it was identified uh, way before this, actually, um, as a causative agent for these mottled um, patterns on tobacco leaves. And it was uh, commercially a very um, bad and non-desirable thing. And it was Rosalind Franklin who actually hypothesized that this virus was hollow and that the RNA inside it was the genetic information that was carrying everything for the new viruses. And she did a lot of uh, measurements on this. It was a hypothesis, and she actually uh, um, uh, built a model of this for uh, a big science expo in 1958. And um, after her death in 1958, actually, this was confirmed by Aaron Klug, who worked with her here at Birkbeck on this. And he, in fact, uh, received the Nobel Prize in 19. 62 in chemistry for his work on viruses and um, other um, biological material. Um, so these um, viruses are 300 nanometers long, so that's 300, uh, um, uh, let me get this right, thousandth millionths of a millimeter, if you, can't, if you can imagine um, such a small thing. And this is 2.3. Um, thousands, millions of a, of a millimetre, so unimaginably small. So we can't see these things with a microscope, and that's an important point. We have to use um, X-rays to look at them. So here's another virus which was solved in 1989 by David Stewart in Oxford, foot and mouth disease virus. Because the three-dimensional shape of this is known, um, they've been able to now just design uh, a better vaccine against foot and mouth disease virus that's not so temperature sensitive um, and doesn't have to be given so often. And the reason I like to show this is it actually made the front cover of the Daily Express. Can you imagine? So that virus um, was on the front cover. David was extremely proud of himself. <laughs> um, not page three, the front cover. Right, so um, 
What, uh, what, what about these crystals? Well, I've mentioned that they're regular arrays of atoms. In our case, they're regular arrays of entire molecules, not just atoms. And you can imagine them as a three-dimensional array of soldiers, where the soldiers are more or less the same, because they've all been uh, had to dress the same, and they're all more or less the same height. Um, but they'll have small differences. You know, one will be holding the finger out like this, one will have a bigger nose than another. So there's small changes, but on the whole, they're the same. Now, the problem with protein crystals in particular is I mentioned that diamond is hard. It's just made of carbon atoms. Protein crystals are, you can imagine these soldiers are actually in a swimming pool. So there's liquid around them. There's water around um, the actual soldier. And then in between, you saw that we had robots that made the crystals. We had all sorts of other stuff, polyethylene glycol, um, salts, and so on, to try and get crystals. Because it is still a dark art. You set up 7,000 conditions. You just pray to your gods that you're going to get a crystal. And uh, we recently finished a project on the tuberculosis enzyme, which is a drug target. And we set up over 7,000 conditions, and we only ever grew one crystal, which was 20 microns in size, only one ever. Uh, luckily, we managed to get the structure from that one crystal, but that's a, a fairly nerve-wracking experience when you've only ever grown one after two years, and you've got to get it up in front of the x-ray beam. So here are some crystals, just to show you the sort of size. This is half a millimetre. These are insulin crystals. Handling is absolutely critical, because as soon as you take these uh, crystals out of the liquid, the soldiers all start sort of leaning different ways, and the order, the reproducibility um, of the crystal is spoiled. So we have to handle them really carefully. And uh, we have ways of growing crystals now that don't like water very much, and uh, they, in these sort of globby um, snake things here, which are they're really horrible to handle. They're all right if they're colored. You can actually see the crystals. But you know, it looks lovely before you open the drop. And then you look away, and you come back, and they're all crazed and under the microscope, and they start to dissolve. And so there's a, a bit of um, uh, technical messing about in order to get these. Um, when you actually have, have the crystal, there's a lot of variables you can try in order to grow them. The concentration of the protein, the pH, any additives, the temperature, four degrees room temperature. Anyone know what GMN stands for? Grandmother's maiden name. Ha! You've heard me before. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it stands for grandmother's maiden name. And it's just to give you an idea of how random the, the whole crystal growing process is, that it would it depend on the day of the week, um, whether you could get them. And also gravity. I won't have time to go into that, but it's quite a, a fun story with me and the newspapers and, and gravity. So what do we do with them once we've got them? Well, we do something really unlikely. We make a small loop of fiber, um, and we, uh, just as you blow bubbles in the bath, uh, I bet you still do, you know, that, uh, so the, the soap solution, pull, we, if you pull that out, you get a film of it across the little ring that you then blow. We pull the crystal out of the drop where it grew with a little loop, and it's held by the surface tension of the liquid across it here, and then we plunge it into liquid nitrogen. We have to do a few things first in order not to make it explode. Um, uh, because if we collect our data by hitting this with x-rays at a minus 173 centigrade, then we get about 70 times more data than we do at room temperature. And this is because if you imagine cannonballs hitting our array of um, soldiers, the cannonballs are going to actually knock off various parts. You, you saw Ozzy losing his eye in the uh, little video, knock off parts and uh, spoil the disorder of the crystal. And then the nose travels through the array of soldiers, knocks off somebody's finger and so on. And at these very cold temperatures, that uh, slows down the movement of the parts um, through, through the crystal and preserves it. So this is now um, you, the way that we uh, collect our data. Now you might say, but my body is not at minus 173 centigrade, and you told me you were going to find out the biological function um, of this protein by knowing what the three-dimensional structure was. True, but it turns out that what the, the shapes that we find at 100 Kelvin, minus 173, can predict the, the shapes at room temperature, and there are just very small changes um, in between. So the overall fold of the, of the, of the uh, spaghetti is the same at low temperature as it is at high temperature, and it enables us to do our experiments. So what does it actually look like in practice at the synchrotron? So this is the goniometer, the crystals here, the x-ray beams coming here, and it's being kept cold by a stream of very cold nitrogen 
uh, coming onto it while we hit it with X-ray be at the beam. So what do we need? Well, we need a lab source, as Rosalind Franklin used, or diamond light source that I use now. Very, very strong and um, beam of X-rays, very intense beam that you can change the energy to. You have to condition the beam a bit. And in fact, a wonderful thing I discovered for this lecture was that the X-ray source that Rosalind Franklin used to take the famous DNA Photo 51 was actually built at Birkbeck. I thought you'd like that. Um, so, uh, um, uh, because they had made a fine focus X-ray machine here, and Rosalind Franklin and, and Ray Gosling, her student, or well, was Morris Wilkins' student, but became Rosalind Franklin's student, came over to ask if they could buy one of these. And the two inventors, Ehrenberg and Speer, said, oh, no, you, you don't need to buy one. We'll give you the prototype. So they actually took it back to King's with them. And uh, Bert Beck was uh, responsible for that technology. I thought you... That's very nice. OK, sorry. The, um, so um, the, uh, the, we then have the crystal way out of proportion here. And then we have a detector. And I was a nuclear physicist, but I changed fields because the sort of nuclear physics detectors were coming into protein crystallography. And they needed somebody to uh, come and look after them. The sort of sizes we can now use, I don't know what, sorry, that has appeared from somewhere. Um, about, oh, it's from Bragg's, from about Bragg's. Um, the, the sizes of these crystals now, we can use a 5 micron, that's um, um, 5 millionths of a metre, um, or um, in-house we can use 50 millionths of a metre, so really very, very small um, crystals. We see this pattern of spots when we hit the um, X-ray uh, beam uh, on, on our crystals um, caused by interference, and here's diamond uh, light source where we do our experiments, it looks like an enormous snail from the... Um, uh, from, from the Ridgeway, there's an electron beam travelling around here very near the speed of light which gives off X-rays tangentially and the beam lines are built um, um, to, to take those X-rays. And this is what a typical experiment would look like. So it's quite heavy technology um, and hidden in here is the tiny, tiny micron-sized crystal um, with, with all the other stuff that we need to do our experiments, the sample changer and so on. It's now highly automated, and we can even operate this stuff from the lab at home. Uh, I can do an experiment in Grenoble from my sitting room, which is absolutely extraordinary. I can operate the hardware now uh, remotely. Uh, it's really staggering. OK, so where have we got to here? We've got our synchrotron providing very intense x-rays. We've got the crystal in the loop held at 100 Kelvin, minus 173 centigrade. We've got the diffraction pattern um, here. And actually, I've got an illustration here of a, of a laser, uh, which uh, is not... Oh, yeah, there is. Sorry, I think I can blank this and just show you... Twice. No, twice. Thank you. OK, so we can see the interference pattern from two fringes here, which is diffraction. And that's similar to what we're seeing when we hit the X-rays onto the protein crystal. That's not... Um, OK, so um, we can see the diffraction. Um, uh, and then we do this Fourier transform, which I'm not going to go into. And we get some grotty looking electron density. So what we actually measure here is the green electron density, which we can then fit the amino acid chain that the, uh, um, that the um, uh, chemists have told us about um, to. And then we so-called refine our structure. And it makes you believe in atoms. Now, I've got to come clean and say that's the best one I ever got in my life, right? Normally, what you see is sausages of this green stuff, more like this, rather than individual atoms. This made page three of the Melbourne Age. Very proud of that. Um, but I didn't know anything about it. The reporter rang me at seven in the morning from Australia. Unknown to me was recording everything I said. And I said, I'm so excited. Instead of seeing sausages, I can see individual balls in my electron density. <laughs> Big mistake. I then started to get emails from Australia saying, how are your sausages, Elspeth? Um, so, you know, always be careful what you say to the press because... Um, so, but you can see here that this is a double bond between these two atoms, two carbon atoms here, whereas this is a single one. They're merged together. So this is the best we ever do in protein crystallography. Small molecule crystallographers get this sort of thing all the time. So what about Bragg's law? I've mentioned the Bragg's. What they worked out was the relationship between those spots, the spotty pattern that I just showed you here, the diffraction pattern, 
here and the spacing of the layers of atoms in the crystal, if you like, the distance between the soldiers. So this is the only formula in the whole talk, um, but I hope you enjoy it because it's fantastic. Um, and um, the wavelength is the energy of the X-rays that we're using, which is fixed usually in a single experiment. The angle is the angle that the X-rays scatter from the planes here, and the D is the distance between the planes. And you can see that if D is small, so that we're getting high detail of our molecule, then theta will be large, because this is fixed. So if that gets smaller, that has to get bigger. That means the spots at the edge of the pattern, which are at high theta, are giving us the detail of the molecule, and there we'd really like to see. But many crystals, unfortunately, especially protein crystals, don't like giving us spots right out here. So what we do is, this is a low resolution um, ly lysozyme model, where uh, the, the, oops, the spots were only in the middle here and didn't give us enough detail because the D was too big and the theta was too small. If we get a better crystal, which gives us spots right out to the edge, because the soldiers are very nicely lined up in, 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 in three dimensions, then we can get a much more detailed model of our protein. And for drug design, we need uh, more detailed uh, um, models so that we can see where the active site is, where the bit that really matters is. So if we go back to our neuraminidase from bird flu, from flu, I didn't uh, mention, but there's nine different of the, uh, ones of these neuraminidase is found in wild waterfowl. Only one and two have made it into human flu so far. But if you think there's 16 different H's uh, found in wild waterfowl, there's two more in bats. And nine neuraminidases, 16 times nine, is an awful lot of combinations of flu that could come into human population. So these top ones are human flu, English duck flu, Ukrainian duck flu, and noddy turn from the Great Barrier Reef flu. Um, and these, these are beautiful, and we can get lovely clean diffraction patterns from these crystals, whereas these ones are horrible. These look beautiful, but they're very, very nasty. Um, because they're multiple and they haven't grown. The, the soldiers are basically in blocks, all facing in different directions, and they're not, not doing their clean looking forward. This was isolated from the blowhole of a, wa a whale, this uh, strain here. We don't know if a bird left a message in the blowhole of the whale um, or whether the whale actually died of flu. Um, we don't know that. So I've been lucky enough to go to the Great Barrier Reef to collect um, bird flu samples from these noddy terns, these rather nasty looking, uh, well, the beaks are rather nasty. Um, and uh, in fact, um, uh, no, okay. <laughs> this is my best school friend who uh, is a high court lawyer and came as my technician on my last trip. And we put these black um, uh, uh, sheets underneath the, the, the trees. We didn't have to catch the birds. Uh, and then when they, because it's a gut disease in, in, in birds, flu, we were able to run in every time they left a message and uh, take the swab uh, and then um, go in and try and isolate bird flus. And we did get some uh, H5N2s from these birds. It's a wonderful way to have a holiday, go and collect bird poo. Um, <laughs> So these um, crystals uh, actually were isolated, the, the, the strain was isolated from these noddy terns. These were actually grown on mere, uh, and they were only marginally better than the ones grown on Earth in terms of quality. So here we've got our neuraminidase. Uh, we've chopped it off here with a pronase, with a chemical, grown crystals of it, in, and it's a tetramer, and you can see there's four of them here. We then take the acid, um, the sialic acid, which is the one on your throat that it chops off and soak our crystal in that, um, in that salic acid and redo the experiment. And then we have a look at our electron density. So the red stuff is what we then fit with the model, which is the green and the blue here. And then um, what does that look like? Well, if we look at the outside of the neuraminidase model, uh, the neuraminidase molecule, you can see that there's a little hole here in it, a little um, pocket. And there's also a cleft going up the bottom here. If we soak in salic acid, redo our experiment, and subtract one from the other, we can see where that acid on your throat actually binds when this uh, neuraminidase chops it off. It looks like Mr. Blobby waving at you, but it's actually the, the acid. We can fit the acid here. 
So now what this enables us to do is to look in great detail at that pocket. And what's interesting here is you can see that this is about 460 beads, 460 amino acids, but only about 18 of them matter. The whole of the rest is scaffold for the active site of this, uh, of this influenza protein. So if we um, um, zoom in on this, this is what it looks like from the side. One of them, they go around in fours, but this is just one. The active site, the bit that matters where the salic acid binds and is chopped off is here. And if we look at that in detail, what the Australians who invented the drug Relenza uh, realized was that here's the sialic acid bound in the active site. The blue is the electron density we measure in our crystallography experiments. There was a little gap here, and there was um, a negatively charged amino acid here. So they added a nitrogen on here, uh, which is positively charged, to make a tighter binding um, interaction here with that, um, uh, with that pocket. So the principle here is, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little extra gap here. Um, and if I take out all the sialic acids, I've got a spring-loaded relenza here, which fits in more tightly. So if I sniff relenza when I feel I'm getting flu, it will block up all of these active sites on the neuraminidase. And then when it comes to chopping off the salic acid, they'll all be full already. It's a bit like having a lock with a key in it. I've already got a key in it, so I can't put another key in it. And that's how relenza works. And that's because it stops the sp virus spreading, that's the reason you have to take it when um, you're actually first get the flu rather than you've already get a full inf infection because what it's stopping is, is stopping the spread. So if it's already spread, it's pointless taking Relenza and that's, that's a difficulty. So here it is, this is Relenza um, uh, peaking in the, in, in the active site of neuraminidase and we tend to draw them like this so we can see exactly what's going on. This is the extra bit that the Australians put on to make it bound more tightly and then we can also look at drug uh, mutations that build up as well. Um, uh, so, Relenza. Okay, so, um, the DNA story, um, the, uh, this is, doesn't look like the diffraction patterns that I've been showing you. And the reason it doesn't is that uh, Rosalind Franklin used fibres of DNA rather than crystals. So the fibres were ordered along an axis um, which allowed um, the uh, analysis of this to, to, to realize that the only possible pattern that you can, uh, that can make this cross is a helix. Now, this photograph was actually taken by uh, Rosalind Franklin with Ray Gosling, and then she was about to leave Kings for Birkbeck and gave Maurice Wilkins her pictures, including this one, and he then showed it to James Watson. Um, and I'm not going to go into all that because it's um, just... Uh, it's, a, it's very upsetting, uh, but B, that much has been written, and we have a, an expert here as well on this. Um, so the, what, the, the model was built by Watson and Crick. Um, uh, Watson, having seen this photograph, which gave huge clues, especially about the spacing of the DNA. So what does DNA look like? Well, the DNA that this photograph was taken from was very, very wet. It was 92% hu humidity. It was taken in May 1952. Um, and as I already mentioned, um, the, the generator it was taken on was actually invented at in Bur Birkbeck. So I think you should be very proud of that. Because uh, Rosalind Franklin was extremely experimentally skilled um, in uh, tuning up the X-ray beam and in um, getting uh, the, the fine focus working properly. But um, it was uh, at Birkbeck that Werner Ehrenberg and Walter Speer, who I've mentioned already, actually um, uh, built the prototype. So what does DNA look like? Well, it's uh, two strands um, of a chain with these adenine and guanine, A and G, paired with cytosine and thymine going in opposite directions, running in opposite directions, and realizing that they went in opposite directions was a critical part um, of um, uh, realizing that how they were going to um, mesh together. So this is a bit more detail showing the rings of the, um, uh, of the thymine and, um, and, and the, uh, the sugars as well. There's a sugar, there's a phosphate, and these are the bases that stack parallel. And it's that stacking that gives those lines we saw on uh, photograph 51. So, sorry. Um, so if we look at how this, these pair up, 
um, they, they already knew that the ratio of C to G's, uh, there was always the same C to G's and always the same A to T's. That, that was known already, but it wasn't understood until uh, this model um, w was built. This is the 0.34 nanometer that was all already known from a photograph by Asprey taken in Leeds, but he wasn't able to interpret his uh, pictures. He also had some beautiful pictures which actually uh, they, 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 they compete with Rosalind Franklin's pictures in their beauty. Um, <clears throat> so this is how it went together, and of course, um, once this, was, uh, this model seemed to work and fil fit all the facts, um, Crick and Watson famously said it has not escaped their notice that this gives a mechanism for um, uh, being able to uh, multiply the DNA, to reproduce the DNA. So, in Chris, the last two minutes, um, the developments in crystallography since Rosalind Franklin's time have been uh, absolutely staggering. And even in my 28 years um, as, a, as a reformed nuclear physicist, the change is, has been incredible. So first of all, we now, instead of going to the abattoir every Monday morning to get a load of livers and, uh, and hearts to pound them up to get the protein that we want to study and try and crystallize, um, we now con E. coli into actually growing up the proteins for us. So we can splice the DNA of the, uh, of the bugs here, these E. coli. Uh, we can put in the DNA of the one we want to study, a human protein or a tuberculosis protein, and we can then feed these guys and they just produce, they go into overexpression and they produce the protein we want. But I mean, when I first joined the lab, we used to take delivery of two tons of spinach and that had to all be pounded down in order to uh, uh, get the protein out. And it was getting to the limit of the number of things you could really study, get enough protein to crystallize, until molecular biologists developed these fantastic expression systems. So we don't only use E. coli, we use Chinese hamster ovary cells as well. Um, and some back, and baclovirus from caterpillars. We've got robots that you saw on the, on the video um, uh, that, to set up many, many conditions because we still don't understand what makes a protein crystal grow, uh, very frustratingly. When I changed fields, I thought, well, these people are completely crazy. Why don't they just stop completely, work out what makes the protein crystals grow, and then, and then, uh, and then they could grow which, whatever they wanted. But now, 28 years later, we still um, have to try lots and lots of different things. We've got synchrotrons now providing us with very intense X-ray beams. We've got cryocooling. We've got, um, uh, this is one of the amino acids that has sulfur in, and in order to get some of the information we need, we can feed our bugs on a heavier atom in the same chemical group called selenium, and that gives us a strong signal. If we change the X-ray energy over the edge, the absorption edge of selenium, we can get information we need to get back to the three-dimensional structure. We have fantastic X-ray detectors now, which are position sensitive, so we can see our spots all over them, and they're very accurate. We have incredible computing power, so things we c couldn't solve um, 10 years ago because of very much more powerful software and huge clusters of computers, we can now um, solve them. So what does this mean? It means that we can move forward. Instead of visualizing our molecules now as balsa wood and uh, um, um, papier mache and bits of wire, Luckily, my daughter brought me here in the car, so I didn't have to bring all these on the train. Um, there we can now uh, visualize our molecules on the graphics very easily. You can see this is two different structures of part of human fibronectin that my group solved. And we got two different crystal forms and two different structures. And this is morphing between the two of them. Um, and this is actually the part in fibronectin where Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA binds, uh, which I hope you never get in the hospital, you go to the hospital. But so our visualization now is much improved and how many structures do we have? Well, if we look back to 1993, um, there were about 20 structures in the protein data bank. Protein crystallographers started big data way before um, the rest of the world cottoned onto it. In order to publish our results, we have to deposit the information on where the atoms in our structure are in three-dimensional space in the protein data bank. And we're not allowed to publish our um, papers unless we've deposited in this data bank and we have an accession code. And I think that's really, really good because it means that these structures are available to anybody who wants to access the protein data bank. 
Now, a few years ago, pharmaceutical companies, about 10 years ago now, started to actually patent the structure of human proteins. The Wellcome Trust were absolutely appalled by this and funded three labs around the world, one in Stockholm, at the Karolinska, one in Oxford, and one in Toronto, to actually find the three-dimensional structures of as many proteins, as po human proteins, as possible. In fact, they had to do four a month in Oxford, which is really dreadful. Um, to, I mean, it's like a production line. But they all got deposited in the data bank, even though we don't even know what some of these proteins do, in order that this information was uh, open to everybody. Um, so we've now got 113,000 protein structures in the protein data bank, uh, and this is a resource um, open to, as I say, anyone in the world. However, one of the things that uh, we really haven't, we're just starting to tackle, is the fact that everything I've told you was about these soldiers being in a swimming pool. They were surrounded in water. But 70% of the proteins in your body are not soluble. When you go out in the rain, you don't dissolve. At least I hope none of you do. Um, so um, those are so-called membrane-bound proteins, and their natural environment is actually in a sort of lipid layer. Um, and we are only just starting to be able to crystallize them and, and uh, get their structures, but they're incredibly important as drug targets um, for us. So what about um, the contribution of women to crystallography? Now, there have been many famous female crystallographers. There is an argument, which I don't know where it's from, but I've heard it more than once, which is because it was such a boring field that women could do it really well. Now, I think this is absolutely appalling thing to say, uh, but it, it used to involve a lot of um, uh, mathematical um, uh, per, uh, calculations which women were extremely good at concentrating on. So we have Dorothy Hodgkin, who got the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1964 for her determinations by X-ray techniques for structures of important bio bio uh, biochemical substances. But uh, it's always a question in my mind whether Rosalind Franklin would have won a Nobel Prize had she survived uh, beyond her uh, a very sad uh, death from ovarian and can cancer um, because um, the DNA structure, uh, physiology and medicine was awarded in 1962 to Crick, Watson and Wilkins. You're only allowed three people on a Nobel Prize, not four, um, and you can't have it awarded posthumously. So it, it always seemed to me that uh, uh, that would have been extremely... Uh, interesting to see which three people would have received that prize um, had uh, Rosalind Franklin lived. Um, um, the Braggs I've mentioned, um, they encouraged women scientists hugely. And this is an incredible plot that I got from an American book. Um, and here you see Bernal is on here. And these are all the students that he had. Rosalind Franklin is here, Dorothy Hodgkin is here. So rather perversely, I've coloured in all the women blue. And it's really amazing that these are all uh, women scientists in the early uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, um, and uh, many, many of them I know uh, are, still, are still around, Eleanor Dodson, Margaret Adams, uh, Marjorie Harding, etc. Um, are, are still around. So that's a, I think that's a great um, example to some of our academics, male and female. If you can rear that many female scientists um, who have uh, really made critical contributions, um, then you've really done something for diversity. Um, this is my favourite um, ladies' uh, X-ray crystallography uh, picture. It's Kathleen Lonsdale, who was a Quaker and a conscientious objector during World War II, and she refused to go on fire duty. Um, so she got locked up, actually, in jail. And in jail, she worked out the structure factor equations, uh, the equations that link the spots, basically, um, with, 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 with the intensities um, for some of the... Uh, some of the um, symmetry groups. But this is a, te te a Quaker tapestry of which there's 77. Um, they're in the um, museum in Kendall, and I highly recommend it if you've got half an hour to spare and you're going through Kendall, um, because there's, a, there's one for cricketers, there's one for social reformers. Um, they've been made by, uh, sewn by Quakers all over the world. And this one is the scientist one, and there's John Dalton with the elements. There's Arthur Eddington, who's an astrophysicist, but there's Kathleen Lonsdale, and here's an X-ray tube and a diffraction pattern, and she found the, uh, the, the, the structure of, of hexamethylbenzene, the flat. So um, lastly, I'd just like to thank my group. Uh, I wonder what's going to happen in the next 100 years and next um, of, of, of protein crystallography. 
Uh, we're going to have membrane protein crystallography. It's really just begun. We can perhaps do single particle imaging now um, of uh, protein molecules, perhaps with a free electron laser. Bioinformatics is becoming incredibly powerful. Um, and we can perhaps um, get to the point where we don't need X-ray crystallographers at all because we can predict how this is going to fold up like wet, sp wet spaghetti um, uh, from the computer. But you can see here that the very, very energy, uh, very shallow energy minima that could determine how this could fold up. And if you take every possibility, um, every interaction, every possible interaction, it would take the age of the universe to uh, actually sample them all and see which one has the lowest energy. So um, that um, is, uh, I think, that there's enough, um, enough work to keep us going for a bit longer. Ah, that's okay. Um, so, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Alice. So, what Elspeth did say, this is the first time she's been out of bed for the last week or so. I, we had a nervous time wondering if she's going to make it, but she's made an extra special effort to be here. And thank you also for her daughter. For driving ahead. Could anybody like to ask a few questions before we have a drink reception outside? That usually cuts the number of questions quite successfully. <laughs> <laughs> question. Yeah, you yeah. chart like about five slides back. You, you had the big red bars that were growing. What were the smaller kind of blue or purple? Ah, oh, yes, sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't explain that. So the blue ones are the per year. Uh, numbers and the red one is the cumulative number. So in fact this one I... Um, no it was, sorry, that was actually in October I think. So I think it was, um, uh, it's flattening off a tiny bit uh, because people are tackling bigger complexes and harder, uh, well membrane proteins and you know you work for four years on one of those. Um, but um, the uh, and the structural genomics uh, consortia have also got all the low-hanging fruit. They've got all the easier ones, and now it's getting slightly, slightly tougher. But yeah, um, it is sort of carrying on. I'm sorry, I should have updated that this morning, and I didn't, didn't do that. Right, fair enough. I didn't, I didn't really explain it. So in here, I've got two grids. And as I and when I do that, I get an interference pattern set up between the light waves, very similar to the what's happening when you get interference um, of the X-rays landing on an atomic grating. I can't use an atomic grating here because it's just far too small, and I'm not allowed to bring an X-ray gun in here. Um, but uh, so I'm using just light and, and a diffraction grating to do that. Uh, but you can see the sort of uh, spots um, as I rotate them relative to one another. Do you see the pattern changes here? Yeah, as they interfere. So, uh, uh, Diffraction is quite a complicated phenomenon. Uh, actually, I become more and more convinced nobody really understands it. But um, <laughs> uh, we have a picture of it that seems to work and a model that allows us to predict what's going to happen uh, with the interference. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, multi parameter space. So, <laughs> um, so uh, the, the problem is that there's so many variables um, that you have to just try and change one variable at once, and that gives you a huge matrix of things. Um, are you, were you trying to imply that women were better at multitasking? Yes, I thought, yeah, I thought it was. I, I agree that women are much better at multitasking. <laughs> um, Yes, I, I, I saw a good, no. Another question? Yeah. Yes, you know, you know when you were saying about the, the, the binding sites for uh, the virus and then also for the, the protein, right? Is it, is it possible to um, have something else bind to the virus instead of the protein? Um, you mean... In your, you mean in your, so you've got the virus, which has these two proteins sticking out of it, a bit like at parties when you have cheese on sticks, you know, bits of pineapple sticking out. 
and then and, and one of those is latching onto a sugar on the outside of your cells. Uh, yes, in fact, um, it's a very good point because the, um, some lawyers in London sniff relenza all flu season so that they're ready, um, so that if they breathe in a flu virus, then those, um, the, the little pockets on the, on the neuraminidase, on the, on the tetramer that are sticking out, immediately get blocked with the, with the relenza so that then it can't work at all. So they take it as a prophylactic. Um, but it's a small molecule drug rather than a big protein. Okay, which, is, which it blocks the protein. Right? Yeah, it blocks the protein on the virus, that's right. Is, is there, um, okay, it blocks the, it blocks the protein on the virus. Is there something that can actually uh, make that um, protein on the virus null and void other than just blocking the protein? The oh, I see what you mean. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, um, there probably is something, but it might harm human beings. The problem is you've got to be, be quite careful um, because the, the, there isn't a neuraminidase that looks like flu virus neuraminidase in humans. But with drugs, um, design drugs, you've always got to be very careful that it's only going to act against what you want it to act against, not against other things. Okay, so, so damage, yeah, yeah, both. yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, one of the things that the pharmaceutical companies have to always do is test that there's nothing else going to be uh, um, actually blocked that you need. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, no, do step outside and grab a drink on the way. I'm not sure whether Elizabeth will be able to stay, unfortunately. But I think, oh, can we stay a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love to meet some of you, yeah.